Well, welcome to uh, chapter five, and uh, today we're going to try to get through the bulk of chapter five and explain to you uh, the the parts and pieces that you need for this, and also get you started on the lab for the, at the end of chapter five, so that you can at least try to to get uh, that started. So, uh, basically. Um, once you've learned enough about how to set up a program, which was hopefully done in Chapter 3 and Chapter 4, we now are turning our, our sights on how to actually write a program and uh, basically uh, what kind of uh, information do you need to be able to write a program, um, which is different than the techniques that we are using to try to explain uh, the the, the techniques for actually constructing the program. So this is more of an idea of how do you start with a blank sheet of paper and move from that blank sheet of paper on to uh, something that actually has meaning. And so here we are looking at, um, first of all, how a process is, is, is done. And uh, this is not something you need to memorize or anything like that, but you need to think in terms of how you start and what you do first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth in order to get a project done. So usually it starts with uh, you in a meeting, sitting there in a meeting and listening and trying to ascertain what is being requested. That's the inquiry and uh, you ask questions, you probe, you try to come up with ideas, and many times you have to put out a quote, or maybe you will be asked to do an estimate, but you have to have some kind of an idea at the beginning what it is you're trying to do. Uh, many times you're going to be asked to order equipment to design something, and uh, that means you have to, con to uh, work with people to get the design done and that type of thing. Uh, you have to then work at the implementation, getting it to the physically where it's supposed to be, and then the installation at its final uh, resting place, and then the commissioning, uh, the acceptance, and the, uh, the, the, the moving toward getting uh, paid to actually saying it's done. And that sometimes um, takes quite a little bit of time. Sometimes you don't know how long it's going to take, so you have to prepare as best you can, and there's where the, the real fun begins, and then at the end you're all happy because it worked, and you're able to say we were successful, and uh, you move on to the next one. So uh, basically uh, we go through these and we say, okay, now how would you ever do this? Well, here's an example of a, of a process. This is a rather simple process, but it yet it brings up the point of how would you do it? And we come back to this from time to time as we go through the t this course because we get better and better at being able to ask good questions. But at this point in time we're just going to talk about a pr process. And this is a condensing of uh, juice and uh, first of all you bring in the uh, juice, uh, the, the, the raw pulp juice that has just been run through a juicer from the uh, out in the field and they, they bring it in and they, they run it through a juicer and then they bring that into this vat. So this is like orange juice that has just been squeezed from oranges. comes into this vat. Okay, now it comes in through a valve. We know that because it's labeled and we let it come in and we let it come in and we don't have the agitator running, we don't have the heater on, we don't have anything on, but we let it fill up until it goes to the high level. At that point in time, we stop. We stop this valve. Then we say, okay, now we're going to do the condensation part of it, which is basically to, to take some of the water out of the process. So when you're shipping this from, let's say, Florida to Massachusetts or someplace like that, you're not just shipping water. You're shipping some water, but not nearly all of it as water. And you want to be able to add water back in at the other end to make it taste like normal water orange juice. So basically what you want to do is you want to evaporate some of this out. Well, you want to do that judiciously and you don't want to get it too hot or you're going to destroy the pulp. 
So you want to heat it a little bit, but not over a certain temperature. Once you get to that temperature, you turn off the heat. And then once you get down to the mid-level, you say, I've done enough. I've done enough condensation or enough evaporation, excuse me. And you will then, at that point in time, let this other valve take what's left out to a loading dock and you put it on, you, 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 you put it on another uh, truck and this truck then takes it to your final destination. So that's the process. Now you push, there's a start button that says start to, to, to the fill and there's a done that says I'm done and then I'm ready to empty. So those are the two parts to this, the push buttons. You have to ask yourself, what does it take to make this thing run? A lot. So what do you do? You write things down. That's one of the first things you do. You write down everything you possibly can, and this is one of those that you see you can write things down. And what else, what other tricks do you have? Well, you have timing diagrams. Timing diagrams are very useful to be able to ascertain how to write logic. So again, a timing diagram, very useful. Also, if you can verbalize something, if you can verbalize it, you can usually write it. And that's one of the other things you can do is you can verbalize it. So this would be a statement, kind of Boolean statement, written out in Boolean, but if you can write it, you can then program it. What else can you do? You can write down all the I.O. You can start with the inputs, you can add the outputs, and what we talked about the other day was inputs can either be high or low, in other words, normally open, normally closed. Outputs tend to be most of the time normally open or a one assignment. So basically you can do this. Now if it's a zero it means usually that there's a reason for it being that and in this case high level switch if the high level switch turned the wrong way it might allow a overflow of the tank and you don't want that. So basically that would be an example of that. And this would be another one. If it's exceeded above that temperature, you want to be able to, if a wire fell off, you don't want it to continually heat up the, the, um, the mixture. So those are some. And you can, if you want to, do timing diagrams like this. This is great. These are great. These are fantastic. And you can write. This was written in function block diagram, but you can write in function block diagram, or you can write in ladder. This is function block. Okay, and that gives you some ideas as to how to get started. Now we're not going to test you on that, but we're going to ask you to basically be able to know that you can, any of these things can be useful as far as being able to do that. And we're going to practice a lot of times starting with starting programs. Okay, so we're going to start programs not from scratch, but from a known point. And then hopefully as you get along, you, you can start you get more confident you can do them from totally from scratch. The other thing you need to know is what to call things. How do you address things? And if you look at it, you can say, ah, I, I, I really don't know what to call things. I just call them what you said to call them, okay? And here is a grid of the, the M table, that is in the, the, the memory table of the Siemens. Now, they number the memory table starting at zero. So there would be a byte zero, a byte one, a byte two, a byte three, byte four, byte five, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they have a limited number of this size of this table. Now you say, well, what if I run out? Well, you can add other blocks, but this would be like a central clearinghouse station for all your information. Now you're gonna see that for many things we use these M blocks for just about everything that we do. There's coming a time in chapters later that you will learn that that's not necessarily always what you do. But now we're just going to use these M blocks bits for whatever we need. And we just throw them in there and they say, okay, we'll just let them take care of it. Now what's wrong with that? Well, the downside of that is that you can double use something. You got to be careful. It's like I have a deck of cards. I have so many cards. I have 52 cards usually, right? 50. 
52 cards in a deck. Okay, so if I have 52 cards in a deck, what do I, what do I do with those? Well, I can use them. I can play them. But once I played them, I can't play them again. And that's the way it is with this M table. If I use a bit or a byte or a word for something, I can't turn around and use that for something else. Now the software tries to keep track of that, but you can go back and you can override that and you can actually double use some of this lo these locations. So you gotta be careful. The Q is for outputs, the I are for inputs, the M are for this internal memory or these bits and words inside. So we're gonna use the M's for a lot of things, but again, we're gonna, we're not gonna worry about it, but anyway. So, here is the wiring, and I'm not going to stress this too much right now because we're going to be wiring things later on, but right now we're not going to do that. We're going to work with M bits instead of output bits, and in, in, so we're going to look at things as M bits. Okay, so when we get down to the actual program we're going to write, we're going to not write it with I's, we're going to write it with M's, and we're going to set there and we're going to toggle those bits on and off, and that's how we're going to deal with it for just a little while until we get a little bit better at it. So again, I'm going to go, go through this and I'm going to show you these uh, tags. Now they give you an option of, a, of an immediate uh, tag and don't use those. Those are for, we're not going to use those. So just use the M or global bits. So we're going to talk about that and it's, that's the, the way we're going to deal with things. Okay, so we're going to do that programming. I want to show you some of that programming in a little bit. We've talked about this before, but we're going to talk about it again. Now, Alan Bradley has two types of addressing. One has these fixed bit informational tags, and that's their old style. Their new style doesn't have that, and it lets you basically program anything you want. The old style, RS-500, lets you build in uh, different what they call files, but in those files, there's like a deck of cards. Each of them has their own deck of cards, and you can use those bits or bytes or words however you want to but you can again double use and that's a danger that they actually let you do that but on the other hand it's fixed and you can see it so this is their tables or their files and you would put binary typically in the b3 file and you would put integers in the n7 file and floating points in the f8 file and that's how you would begin with the uh, RSLogix 500. Now you say, is this still appropriate? Well, it is. The, the uh, Siemens has moved from their older 300 st style to their newer 1500s and 1200s. And they hope that you enjoy the old ones as you, if you still have them. But they you stress the new ones. Alan Bradley's done the same thing. They have control logics and compact logics processors that use RS Logic 5000, but they also have older equipment that still is using the RS Logic 500. And this is the style of the I/O or of the of the of the bits for the RS Logic 500. I just bring it up because it's here. It's still in use and people are still using it. So again, I don't want to overstress it, but here it is. Now, down here is the newer style of the Allen Bradley, and that is the style that you would see today, predominantly, with the newer style. Uh, we're going to get to it eventually. This is the RS Logic 5000 addressing. So, if you wanted to create a bit in RS Logic 5000, you just say, okay, uh, throw me in a contact, and then I, I program it, and it creates that bit for me. So, it really is taken care of for you. Um, it's, uh, I hate to say the word, it's simple, but it basically, they, they put the bits off someplace, uh, the, the bytes or whatever, and you don't know where they're located, but you do know that you have access to them. And double using, doesn't worry about it because it, a name is unique. So every name that you put in there is unique. This would be just like programming in C or some other uh, programming language that you would just basically say I create a variable and you do and away you go so again we don't know where these are located don't really care but there they are okay so that's how you do it you define a tag you program it right click on it define a tag and as a bool a boolean and then you're and then you're done okay there's the bool tag type 
Very similar to Siemens in that regard. Now, one thing that isn't similar to Siemens in Allen Bradley is that when you say, I want a timer, you get the whole works. You get the works in a drawer. You get everything about that timer all in one variable. It's called the timer variable, and it is named by a certain name, and it has the the attribute of a, of a timer variable. And there's all the things that we would ever want to look at in a timer. And we're going to cover those later on when we talk about timers. Now, you can take an integer and split it up into 16 bits if you want to. There's no reason to, but you can just by this addressing scheme. So both of them have this capability that I, I just showed it to you for Alan Bradley. Okay, if you want to do that, you can. Most people don't. Now, why do not most people want to do this, this tagging, using some kind of a cryptic method? Well, they don't because this is not meaningful. You want something that you can look at and say, ah, I know what that is. You know what it stands for. This word right here means something to you, but this, this is the tenth of a sequence of this, but we really don't know what that is. So it really doesn't mean very much to us. So that's kind of the reason for staying away from that although some people do that and then and then they and people wonder why it's so hard to read um, here is a an array of 20 variables of reals and that's something that you will talk about in a later chapter as well now where do they store their programs well typically the Siemens stores the main program in OB1 and you can do that and you can make your whole program in OB1 if you want to or OB1 can call other programs in Allen Bradley they do the same thing except that you can very easily right here have a main program and then it can go off to subroutines and typically that's how you would write most of your programming you'd write them in subroutines so the main routine branches off to a subroutine you don't have to but if you wanted to you can and that's typically how it's done so you can the subroutines can be any of these these different uh, languages. Okay, so that gets you back to uh, a little bit of how to create a um, address, and we're going to do this by explaining or by by doing by actually doing some. Now we're going to get back now to uh, an idea that is important, and we're going to um, talk about it a little bit. And that is the De Morgan theorem. And this is something that you may or may not have studied before. But basically it says what? If I want the negative of something, what do I do? Well, I do these things right here. I take the not of something is, is this. And I look at this and I say, okay, now this is some of the basic formulas for taking the not of something. So if I want to take the negative of something, what do I do? Okay. Well, here's the rules. Okay, these are the rules for taking the not of something or taking the inverse of something. All right, so now I'm coming down to something a little bit more enticing, like what is the, maybe not enticing, but how do you take the negative of this? Well, you can see that it's this part ended with this part gives me my function. So if you take the De Morgan of something, it is the not of this ORed with the not of this. So do you see that? So let's concentrate on just this part. The not of this is what? The not of this is what? Well, you take the not of the A, which is the not A, and, and you flip it from OR to AND. So the not of this is this. The B, the knotted, would be the, the normally open, and the C would be normally closed. So the not of this is this. And you remember it was anded with this over here. So now what do we do with it? We or it with that. So take the function of the, the right side, and you take the not of it, and what do you do? You put the two pieces back together, don't you? You put the bet, you put the put them back together. So you say, what is this? Well, if this was on, this up up here was on, this down here would be off. If this was on, 
the thing up top would be off. That's called it a Morgan theorem. And again, we do this for a reason. We don't just do this just as an exercise. We do this for a reason. And that reason is to get you to start writing in ladder. Because up until now, you've probably not written anything in ladder. And this gets you started. So there are some problems in this chapter, and we're going to assign a couple of them. But basically, it does that. And here's some more examples. I want you to go through and work with some of these examples. And also, we talk about in this section about verbally taking a ladder and, and converting it to Boolean, how it's read. We should be able to do that as well. And also, this you can we have what we call a, a, a truth table, which is evaluating states. Now, again, this is something that they do in, in digital logic, and they do a lot of it. But how would you ever do this? You'd say, well, I have to evaluate this for all these states. And how many states are there? Well, there's how many elements are there? There's six elements. So there's two to the sixth states, or 64 different states. How many people do you think actually build a, a, a truth table like this and fill in all 64 states? How many times do you think I did that and after I graduated from college and went out in the work world? Well, the old answer is slim and none, but the answer truly is zero. I never did a, 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 a state table for evaluation. Why would I not do that? Well, you look at this and you say, what does it take to turn on G? Well, it takes the not of B, right? B has to be off. So if B is on, this isn't going to turn on. If B is off, then I can concentrate on these. But you see what I'm saying? If B, B is my most critical element here. And typically, that's what you would concentrate on. Make sure that you've got this right. If that isn't right, it's either wrong for one of two reasons. Either it is wired wrong, it's the wrong in the wrong, or it's logically in the wrong position. So it's one of two things. It's either wired incorrectly or it's the wrong logic. To get G to turn on, one of two things has to happen with B. And then you concentrate on these others. You go to you go here first, then you go here, and then you go here. So if you're concentrating on what does it take to turn on G, concentrate on B. Then you concentrate on A and D. Then you concentrate on C, E, and F in that order. Any questions about that? And you can leave state diagrams or, or truth tables to your to uh, somebody else. OK, so another common programming error is this. And you will probably end up doing this. Most people do. I've done it, so don't worry about it. All right, so I'm programming along, and I'm thinking about a certain thing. And then I program about it later, and I program the same thing again. So this is a scanned program, isn't it? So it does this one, and then it does this one, it does this one, it keeps on going. So it does this one, and it sets this. Then it does this one, and it sets it again. So what happened to this one? It got wiped out, didn't it? So don't do that. If this actually is something that you're trying to think about, Think of it like this. It's either this one or it's this one. Or maybe there's something else that, that you might want to add in there as well. But this, this one is no good. In other words, if I walked up to you and said, and you would say, this never turns on, but all three of these are on, I'll ask you, you've double used that bit. And that's why this is not working. Okay? Double use of coils, usually a bad thing. There's a... There are ways for you actually to, to, to get it right, but most of the time it's a bad thing. This would be the better approach. And you can do that either with Allen Bradley or Siemens. Either one does the same thing. They'll let you do it, but you shouldn't do it most of the time. This example of combinational logic. Now, you, you may have never thought of this, but uh, when, when we taught digital logic uh, at the two-year school, two-year level, and we had a quarter system. In the quarter system, we went 10 weeks. Um, there was a two-core sequence for digital logic. One was called combinational logic. One was called sequential logic. So basically, you either did, 
combo or sequential. And the combo logic was basically combinational ands and or type logic. We did a lot of ands and or stuff. Sequential logic had to do, had to do with flip-flops and memory circuits. So basically, you took one and then you took the other. In this case, chapter five is concentrating on combinational logic. And this is a, these are story problems. And, and the one above with the, the, um, the um, condenser or the uh, evaporator, excuse me, uh, that was kind of, well, it was both. It's con you're condensing or you're, you're bringing the, the, the uh, orange juice down, but you're also um, evaporating. It's both. That's more than just a combinational logic circuit, although we, we did talk about combinational logic circuits. This one is only combinational logic, and we'll talk a little bit about it, and that is that you, you have rules here, and the rules are stated up here. If you have three pumps, now, if one of these bays and U's come on, these contacts, these are contacts from some other device. We don't know what it is, but something that says this, there's a, something's being washed in here or something's being washed in here. If either of these turn on, we get a pump. We get this pump to turn on. If they both turn on or if one of them is a tall truck, then we turn on a second one. And then we say if both bays are in use with a tall truck or both... In one or both base, a third pump is required. So in other words, the third pump is both of these on and one or the other is a tall truck. Now, what if we had two tall trucks, both bays in use? Well, we don't have a fourth pump, so we can ignore that. But again, we try to write logic for this and we actually show the steps for doing that. Here's part of it. Writing the IO, writing the, converting the logic, writing the three pumps, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Okay, there's the first pump. There's the second pump, and I'll let you do the third pump. Okay. So this gets you started, doesn't it? It gets you a little bit off dead zero. So again, I'm not going to um, give you an assignment right now of, of, uh, of problems in this chapter but I am going to uh, ask you to work through some of the um, some of these um, De Morgan and I will work some of these for you in the next lecture. Let me, before we start chapter six, I'll come back and work some of these and we'll have some of these to, for, uh, for, for working on, okay? We'll work on some of these together. So I'm asking you to just delay a little bit that. Now this is a program off of, this is a, this is a program that you would be asked to write maybe on a test. And by the way, any question that has an asterisk by it has been a test question has been asked at some time in the past. So you know that that's a test question possibly. It's been asked before. And these are, these are good test questions. Okay. So these are all test question type questions. So this is the lab at the end of chapter five. And um, to be blunt, I don't care whether you do um, 35 cents or 45 cents or even 55 cents. I don't really care which one of these three options you do. So there's an option here. You can either do it for 35 cents, you can do it for 45 cents, you can do it for 55 cents. I'm gonna write the, the logic for um, 35 cents, but you can do it for 45 or 55, either any of these three, and I don't really care which one you write it for, but I'm, I'm going to say basically this. This is a, when a flow comes in, this, this one comes in first. In other words, when the dimes come down into the machine, the dime one dime has to come in first. So you don't have to check that. It already is there. So if there's a dime two, it implies that there was already a dime one. If there's a dime three, it implies there's a dime two and a dime one. If there was a quarter one, then you would see the signal. If there was a quarter two, it is implied that there was a quarter one, and you don't have to worry about it. There had to have been a quarter one for there to be a quarter two. Then you push the button for the request, and it comes up either I accept, I don't, or I have change, or I have a reject, okay? So that is the problem, and we're gonna work on that a little bit here, and then we're gonna start working on a uh, solution for it. So basically, uh, 
thy one, two, and three, quarter one, quarter two, and request, and then we have accept, reject, and change. Okay, so we're going to go over, we're going to look at this from the point of view of a, um, of how would we set this up. So we're going to go back and we're going to set this up real quick here. Okay, so we're back and we have a uh, palette and we can start talking about a, um, a um, set of logic. So we've got a dime one, let's just write dime one. We've got dime two. We've got dime three. So we write everything down we can. Quarter one, quarter two, and then we've got a request. So these are our six inputs, and we have an output that is, uh, these are our inputs. We have outputs that are accept. We have change, and we have reject. So we have all those, and we can now start adding up and say, okay, what do we do first? Well, we can we can do a table, can't we? We have inputs. We can have all six inputs written in there. We can have our output. Now, since these are push buttons, these are all push buttons, and since they you push them to get a one, we can basically say, uh, I, they're all normally open switches, so we can just basically this this we can just say that. Okay, so now let's let's just start here. Okay, let's let's just start here and um, and start with a with now. Where where do we start? In other words, how do you start this ladder logic? Well, I don't know, but I'm going to do it like this. Okay. I don't know exactly how to start, but I'm just going to say, okay, these are my outputs, right? These are my outputs, accept, change, and reject. So you concentrate on these and you say, okay, now what is it going to take to get this? So at 35 cents, what does it take to get an accept? Well, it takes a quarter, doesn't it? Because a dime won't do it. So quarter one, at least it takes quarter one and at least dime one to do that, doesn't it? It takes at least quarter one and dime one. Now, does it take more than that? No, for 35 cents, that'll get you done, okay? But it takes at least that, right? That'll get you at least, correct? What about two quarters? Yeah, that'll get me there too, doesn't it? Quarter one and quarter two does in the same way, right? Right? All right. So do you think of anything else that'll do it? I can't think of anything else that'll do it. So that should be part of our logic, right? So let's write that down and see if that, we'll have to try it out, obviously, right? Okay, so we have to try it out, but let's just, let's just say for, for grins and giggles that that's going to be it for right now, okay? So let's just... Let's just do that, okay? So, uh, so now let's say for change, what does it take? Well, if you have change, you have to go above 35. So, at least quarter one and dime one and dime two, if you're going to go the dimes approach, or 
if you have quarters, quarter one and quarter two will give you change. Right? You say, well, what if I have a dime down here? Doesn't really matter. As long as I have two quarters, I've got change. So basically, that will give me change, right? Oh, and I forgot something else up here. What did I forget? Request. Same thing down here. So I've got I've got started. I don't know if this is right or not, but at least it's worth a shot. So, what is it for reject? Well, you can say what? Not dime one, that'll get you. Or let's just say, let's be sneaky. The not of accept and request is a reject. What about that? Might work. You need to try it. See if that works. That's my suggestion is you try it. Okay, so we are back now and we have the, uh, the TIA portal up and running. And with that, we're going to try to uh, see if we can program this. So let's try to put this together, all, all, all the parts and pieces. So basically, we come down here under Programming Blocks, Main, and we look at a device here we call it a contact we bring it down and we let it come right there now we right click on it and it no we, we just say I just say Q1 okay now it's red so we don't know what to do with that so we right click on it and we say what Right click on it and we want to uh, want to find a tag, but how do I do it? I should be able to here. Okay, so I want to define a tag and Ah, wrong type of device. I'm going to say quarter. So I'm going to say, I have to say quarter or something like that. Quarter one. Okay, that way I can now write the tag. See a little squiggly line under the Q min and output, and that does not work. So you have to do this. Define tag. It says local temporary. No, I want a, mo a m global memory. And see, it automatically comes up with an M0.0, .0 and I say define. Now, if I were to tie that to an input, I would say I0.0, .0, but I'm going to tie that to an internal, so I'm going to just say M0.0, .0, okay? Now, I bring another contact down, and I want to call that D1 or DM1, okay? A little squiggly line under it, right click, define tag, and notice it. It says local, no, I want global, and it automatically rolls to the next bit. 
that's good because we now chewed up two bits of that first byte, m0.0 and m0.1, but that's not a big deal. Okay, now over here I have a ability to make this thing go down and then I can okay put it right put it right there so I can come back and I can do the second branch so now I come down here and this is my second branch if it's green I let go and then I can do it so this would be quarter QT1 which is already defined and QT2 which is not defined but I'm gonna okay, when it comes green I let it go QT2 Okay, and it's a right click, it's, it's a bool, not a local, but a global, and I define it as such. Now I bring this, I wanna get this down a little bit so I can see a little bit more here. I can bring this up like that, and I'm, I've got my branch, okay? Now I can bring down this, which is a, another bit, and let it go when it turns green, and that is request, right click, excuse me, I want to double, I want to say REQ. And then little line under it means it's not defined. I have to define it. Not a local, but a global. And then I click define and it rolled it to 0 0.3. And here's my output. So this would be a accept, accept, right click, define. And that's going to be another memory, and I'm going to say global memory is going to be 0 0.4. So there I am. I've got my logic built for that little bit there, but it's it's done. Okay, now what do I do next? Well, I have to make a decision. Do I want to go to network 2, or do I want to keep continuing network 1? I want to just continue on to network 1. Okay, so now I'm going to do the same thing with quarter 1. I'm going to just come up here and control C that. Come down here and control V that. That makes it quarter one. And dime one up here. I got dime one up here. I got dime one down here. So I got that. I got I can control control C. Control V does that. And now I've got another one that I've got to add, which is dime two, which is another and when it turns green, I can let go and that makes that one okay. So now I can say dime two. Okay. Right click. Define tag, global memory, define, done. Come down here again. I call this a sprig. It's my way of saying it. I don't know what it is, but I'm going to at least do something about it. Okay, control C, control V on quarter two. And there I am. And now I'm going to draw this over to here. Now I've got my logic for my second line. And my request is up here. I'm going to come down and do it. Boom. And I've got a coil. I don't want to copy a coil if I... I want to bring a coil down there that's a different coil. This would be change. Okay. Right click. Define tag. Stay away from the, lo stay away from the locals. Go to, go to... Okay, so there's my change. Now what do I have for reject? I'm back over here. And then I come in and I do the not of accept, the not of accept. If I start typing A at C, ACC, it starts and it takes it. Now I've got that already done. And then my request is right here. Control C, Control V. And then I've got my coil for reject right here, which is right there. And I am calling it REJ and Right click, uh, define tag, stay away from locals, Ted, make it a global, define, done. Now you say, well, that's nice, Ted, you did a good job, but now what are you going to do with that? Well, I'm going to have to do something with that, and what, what that is, is what? Come up here and compile. This is the compile button, okay? Now, if you can't remember to compile using this button, you can always come up here under device configuration. Either way, you can do it. Either device configuration, I'll show you how to do it both ways. Right click on the on the square. It says compile hardware and software. That's one way of doing it. The other way is coming up under here and doing it up under here. I like this approach because it's all reminded the same breath what to do. And it gives you all the options. It compiled, 
did it did it work Ted did it did it compile let's go back and see if it compiled if it didn't it'll give you a, an error okay now where will the error come up it'll come up down here won't it it'll come up down here and says what okay so it says there was okay so when it compiled it says hardware is not compiled configuration was up to date the last time I compiled so I hit the compile button twice but it worked right click you can do the download right here. Here's the download, but I'm, I'm going to right click on this and it's download to device right here. And it gives you all the options under this one. It gives you all the options. Reminds you up here, but it reminds you down here as well. Okay. T download hardware and software. We'll do the whole thing. It doesn't really matter. Now it's going to ask you to do this because I already did the download once. This is going to work well. Finish. Now I want to go online, so I can go online here. I want to go online, and I want to see this logic actually working. Okay. Now you say, why did you use all M bits instead of something else? Oh, by the way, uh, it downloaded, but am I on? Um, am I in the run mode? Yes, I am because I got all these green buttons, all these green lights, but. Do I see that? No, until I come over here to the glasses, I don't see that, but now I do. And what do I see? I see a green goal post on the left hand side. If you're Alan Bradley, you'd see a green goal post on the left and on the right, doesn't really matter. But now I come over here and I right click on this. I say I modify. I want to modify that to a one. Watch happens. Look at there, and it wins. So I in this machine I have a quarter one input. I have a dime one so i got this ladder going so i picked a quarter one and a dime one and then i pushed the request button modify to a modify to a one i'm holding my finger on all three and what happened the accept light turned on if i look at my physical outputs i have no outputs on because i didn't wire an input but this would be if i wired that to a q output that would actually have turned on that output so do you see the power of being able to do it either through wiring or through this other approach, which is basically um, a, a way of, uh, of, of, of figuring out these, these, these bits. Okay, modify to a zero. So I want to turn these bits off. I want to turn this bit, um, quarter one, modify to a zero. I want to turn this one to a zero. And I want to turn that one to zero. So basically, I'm back in business now. I don't have anything on now. So let's try this approach. So if I have quarter one, modify to a one. Quarter two, modify to a one. And that should... And then I push the request button, and it would uh, turn it on again that way. So basically, you have this approach of being able to test this out. And again, I'm going to leave you the rest of this to, to try out for yourself. But it, it works, and I think the logic for this whole lab is pretty much in good shape. We're going to be looking at uh, finishing off Chapter 5 and then moving on to Chapter 6. But I wanted to work through some of these problems in Chapter 5 with you. And uh, first of all, let's look at the, the, the very first one. It says a car wash with two bays has pump supplying water pressure. And uh, we see that picture. And we want to be able to uh, identify all the parts and pieces there. So if we do the sensors, the... Um, The sensors would be the uh, four inputs there, and uh, the first thing we would do would be to look at the uh, sensor itself, and um, the sensors, and there's two of them, there's a bay and use contact. It's a function. It's a contact block. And it has an assignment of a one.
There's a bay two in use. And it has the same. And then there's two selector switches. Tall truck. One. And then there's one with tall truck two. And those are also contact blocks. And they'll have an assignment of a one. The outputs, these are the inputs. The outputs are, there's three, pump one, pump two, and pump three. These would be actual motors, motors, and they would all get an assignment of a one. Okay, so that gives you a little bit of an idea about what we're going to be doing here. So now let's look and see what it would take to do the first one. So. What I did at the beginning, when I first started out, was to said to think of in terms of the output. So what would it take to turn on pump one? Well, it says in the literature there, it says, and this, this is a story problem, so it says either, either you have to have bay one in use or bay two in use. And that's all you have to do. Bay one or bay two will turn on pump one. So now let's think about what it would take to turn on pump two. A little bit more complicated here, isn't it? Let's go back to the program. Let's look at the problem and what, is it, so what does it say? It says if one, if both bays are in use, or if one of the bays requires a tall truck, you turn on pump two. So basically, it says here, if bay one and bay two are in use, or if one of the bays is on and requires a tall truck. So that gives you a little bit of an idea how this works. So bay one and bay two, I'll just use bay one and bay two, or bay one and tall truck one, or bay two and tall truck two give us that function. And that gives us, if both are in use with a tall truck and one or both bays, a third pump is required. So if both are in use with a tall truck in one or the other, so that would be a little bit more of the same, pump three. If both are in use, bay one and bay two, with a tall truck in one or the other, that would be that kind of a, an arrangement. And that would give us some logic that we could use to satisfy that question. So that would be a, an answer. It's not the only answer, but it's, a, it's an answer to that problem number one. It says write the Boolean for the above. I believe you can do that and then convert it to ladder. You can just do it in ladder if you want to. It's up to you. Okay, um, now there was a question at the end of chapter four that I asked you to look at, and that was if there was an input that had another status, in other words, if it was normally closed instead of normally open, what would be, how would that change the program? Well, every occurrence in the program would be changed. The normally open would go to normally closed, and normally closed would go to normally open for that, for that occurrence. Same way with problem number two right here. It says, they saw that one of them was wired backwards, and would this have changed the signal assignment? Yes, it would say zero instead of one, 
And in the latter logic, it would every time you had a normally open, it would be a normally close. Every time you had a normally close, it would be a normally open. So it would flip it, okay? So that would be the answer to number two. This, the answer to number two is the same as the answer to number of the problem in chapter four that I ask you to do. Problem number three, which pump tends to be on the most? Well, pump number one tends to be on the most. Is this a good design? Not necessarily. And we're going to discuss that in chapter 10. And we're going to look at a problem in chapter 10 that actually solves that problem. Number four, develop logic in Boolean to turn on an output when switch X and switch Y are energized or when Z is energized. So this is a story problem. Okay, an output when X and Y are energized or Z. So this would be problem number four. So X and Y, that's the and, or Z. Let's call the output A. That's an answer to number four. I'll let you do number five. Number six, same thing. Except you have here a bunch of ands. Key, all three seat belts, and all doors, or same four doors. Okay. So number six. So the key and the seat belt, or nobody sitting there. And four door switches. Now you can start the car. So this is the key, and this is the um, seat belt, or no one sitting there. Seat belt, or no one. Seat belt, and you can see seat belt one, seat belt two, seat belt three, and no one sitting there. This would be door number one. Door number two, door number three, and door number four. And this is the start. Something like that. Okay, so now you can start a car. Okay. Okay, so number seven. So let's write the De Morgan of this. So we notice that we have A, and it is in parallel, or in other words, it's an OR circuit, so now we have to write it as an AND. So the knot of A ended with everything below it. Now we have B, C, E, and D. So those were anded, so now they're going to be ORed. So then B is going to be ORed with not C and not E. And it's going to be ORed with D. And the output here is F naught. So we have the De Morgan of the circuit for number seven. Okay. So we're going to do with that one. Number eight, we're going to do the same thing. OK, 
Okay, so write the De Morgan of number 8. It's all that anded with B naught, so it's all that ORed with B. So let's look at it, and those are ORed, so now they're going to be anded, so it's going to be A anded not A not anded with C and it was anded so it's now it's ORed excuse me with that and then E knotted so that represents the De Morgan of everything on the left the A C D and E so now we have that part and it was anded now it will be ORed with B That gives me my knot F. So it's A knot, C and D knot, E, and then my B. Okay. So that's the De Morgan of number eight. Number nine. The Morgan of this, you see that the A, B, and B naught and C is anded with D and not E, so it will be ORed. So we have the the knot of the first circuit, A naught, anded with B, anded with C naught. And then that is ORed with D naught. ORed with E, and that gives us the output F naught. Okay, so hopefully you get an idea about these circuits, how to do the De Morgan. And I think there's one more at the bottom. Well, I'm going to let you do the number 10. Okay, I'm going to let you do the, the verbal ones as well. Now, number 15 and number 16 are, remember, these are with the old style of uh, Allen Bradley. So this would be number 15. This would be the Rockwell RS Logix 500. And how do they recognize a contact? Well, it would be a B3 colon zero slash two or it could be written b3 slash two all you have to do is you multiply this number by 16 and then add that so in the other ones let's say b3 two slash fit two slash five well how would you write it otherwise b3 slash two times 16 32 plus 7 37 37th bit of that table. 2 times 16, 32, plus, 7, plus 5 is 37. So that would be the equivalent there, and that's how you do that. For number 16, you just do the opposite. It's B3 slash 20. So you divide by 16 and take the remainder. So it's B3 colon what? 1 slash 4. Divide 20 by 16 and take the remainder. So this would be the number and the remainder of 4. And that's how those are done. Okay. So this is like the lab, only these are story problems. So basically, how do you do these? Well, number 17, you do the same thing you would do with a um, Okay, so number 17, you would do the same thing you did before, only it's a little different. So I have two coils out here. 
start cheap and the other one would be start good or good start good okay so how do I get 75 cents if I have four quarters and I can put them in any slot in this case I can put them in any slot okay well I got to define a way of doing that so this is one way of doing it I'm sure there are others So I have a request over here. Let me erase my start good because it's it kind of cramped into the same logic as my uh, other. Okay, so here I am. I've got my logic kind of going here. So quarter one, quarter two quarter three and quarter four so 75 cents is one of these but not the other it's three of these but not the fourth one and request cheap okay so does that make sense that's one way of doing it so how do you request good you get all four lined up right it's easy and then you say request good and here's my coil start good so this would be quarter one quarter two quarter three and quarter four so what is this story problem right getting you used to writing ladder logic all right, so now that you've done that, let's go to the next one, see what we got. It's the same problem, except it's a little different, so we're not going to do that one. We're going to do this one more. We're going to do this one more and we're going to be done with these problems okay promise it's almost done yay okay so we got one more here and we're this is problem number 19. okay so we've got over here we've got um a and d so now they those were anded so they're going to be ORed and so it's going to be A not anded with D, and it was anded with the rest of this. Now it's going to be ORD. And we're going to come back here and we're going to look and say now, okay, now we've got all this other stuff. So now it was anded, so now it's ORD with F. And... Uh, So now we get down to F, and what else it was ORD? So now it is ANDed with what? B. Which was ANDed, so now it is ORD with C. Okay, so it's B not. So it's ORD with C and E naught. So we got A naught and D ORD with everything else, which is F and B naught and with C and D. And this gives us what? G naught.
So that's the answer for the De Morgan of that circuit interchange.